Hello everybody, welcome back to Read and Reread. I am Angelia and it's time for Friday Reads on March 29th. Woo, we're at the end of the month and it's one of those years where Easter falls on, well, it, it technically falls on March, it's the last day of March. If you're celebrating Easter this weekend, happy Easter. I hope you have some hospitable Easter weather for your Easter egg hunt wherever you live. It's going to be kind of hot here. The Sunday forecast, I think, said 86. So the, the city might be full of children with melted chocolate. I don't know. Sorry, I got distracted by the flies. I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. I had to make sure it wasn't something scary than just a fly. That's, it's okay. It's annoying, but it's okay. Could be worse. I live in South Texas. If you know, you know. So yesterday I posted up a call for questions for my 1K Q&A video and I am enjoying seeing the questions that are accumulating there and I'm going to let that roll for quite a few days and then probably next week and put up the video, give people a chance to um, come, up, come upon that video and put their questions. You can also put them here if you want to add something. I'll check. I'll check the last few comment sections before I make that video but so I'm going to talk about all that in that video but I'm very excited and thank you if you have subscribed to my channel whether you've been here forever or you're more recent um, I just appreciate all of you and helping me get to that 1000 mark so let's move on with the weekly uh, wrap up because I have five books to talk about I didn't read five books start to finish this week there was some overflow and then one that I've started that I you know but there's five books that I need to mention all right so let's talk about TV and movies I don't think we watched any movies this week we're still watching Schitt's Creek and Curb Your Enthusiasm and then on for longer shows we tried to watch Foundation and we watched three or four episodes and it just um, if somebody has watched more of that show and wants to tell me that I should come back around to it we we didn't hate it but it was it was just it was kind of slow paced and it would be really boring for 30 or 40 minutes and all of a sudden something interesting would happen at the end and then but they spent most of the time on the boring part and all the brother day and brother night stuff I'm like are we ever does this ever pick up so we kind of bailed on that one and then we started watching Three Body Problem, and that one's really good. We've only seen two episodes. We're hooked. Um, I can't say much about it for two reasons. One is it would be a spoiler, and also I don't really understand. I mean, I, it's like different things are unrolling, and how they fit together, I don't yet know. There's two time periods. One is in the 60s and 70s in China, and one is in current day London, in the current day, scientists are experiencing an anomaly where their data isn't making any sense anymore and there has been a string of scientist suicides and there is, um, there's someone investigating what's going on. And then in the past, there is a woman who is the daughter of a uh, renowned physicist who has died for the cause during the Chinese Cultural Revolution and that's all I can tell you about. It's about the daughter, the adult daughter, and who also has the scientific knowledge. And that's all I'm going to tell you about that. So anyway, it's really good so far. So let's move on to the books. All right. So when we last left off, when we left off last, I don't know. I was I was reading two books that I did finish. And I don't know why there's all these post-it notes stuck to the front of this book, but I did finish Moon of the Turning Leaves by Wagibshig Rice, um, Canadian indigenous author. If you're interested in these books, you need to start with the first book, which is Moon of the Crusted Snow. In that book, it is a post-apocalyptic sort of survival tale of a an indigenous village in northern Canada. Everything, um, it's in the current day in that book, everything suddenly goes off the grid all the power phones internet everything shuts down and since they live in a remote village they don't really know what's going on out in the wider world and they start to hear a few reports from people who make it back to town and some strangers who show up but they don't really actually know it but they have to use 
um, both their just their general intelligence and some traditional skills to learn how to live off the land once they realize that this is not a temporary situation. So that one is just a really interesting. It's very it's a very tight kind of story with because it's all in this town and they don't know what's going on outside. This one's different because it's 12 years, 11 or 12 years later, they're living in a different location now. The survivors from that village have moved to another location where they've set up a community, but they need to move again because they've started to exhaust some of the resources, like the with the hunting and everything in the area. And they want to move back to another area that is in the general vicinity of where their ancestors came from uh, before they were moved and shuffled to different places by colonial activities and, and you know the encroachment of the white people that came to Canada. So they they're kind of scouting out they want to scout out an area around the Great Lakes and so a little group goes on an expedition and it's it's fraught with tension because a previous pair of people also went to try to do the same thing and they never came back. So there's the kind of things like you know the the funny sounds in the woods and threats and coming across other groups of people and they're still trying to collect clues about what might have happened actually 12 years ago and they learn a little more anecdotally from people that they encounter and also it's something happens it's I okay I, this is kind of a niche weird thing that I always find fascinating it because I read a lot of uh, kind of post-apocalyptic and dystopian type novels is when somebody somebody is going through basically the ruins of the previous civilization and trying to understand from what they see and what they find what might have happened and just the idea of everyday life just being stopped in its tracks and so anytime there's these kind of books and then they go into old cities and towns and houses and the things that they find, I just find that really fascinating. And so I have some of that in this book and I was thinking about, this is one of the little notes I, did, I have, uh, it says trying to guess from the remains and the multiple survivor layers. Because when they go into these towns, they can see where, okay, here's how things were to begin with. And then somebody came through later and this happened. And it looks like somebody also came, you know, so there's the way it was and, and whatever's left from that. And then the times that people have squatted in those buildings and just, it's this whole kind of archeological sense of trying to understand what happened, even though it wasn't that long ago and you were around when that ha when that occurred to begin with. So I found that to be pretty interesting. I would say between the two books, I liked the first one the best. Just I thought that the structure was perfect for the themes that Rice was examining. And this one's a little more diffuse. It it feels like a bridge book, really. Uh, you know how sometimes in a series, the first book gets you and the second book is, you like it, but it's not quite as powerful. And then the third book comes in with a whammy. It kind of has that feel. So, and the fact that he's named the two books for two different seasons makes me feel like maybe he's going to do four books. We shall see. The other book that I finished um, that was a carryover from carryover from last week was Liar and Spy by Rebecca Stead. This is a middle grade novel that I just felt like I needed to read after having such a good time rereading When You Reach Me a couple weeks ago. I remembered reading this with my daughter when she was younger she didn't i said hey look what i'm reading and she was like uh <laughs> she didn't she caught she remembered the other one when you reached me she didn't remember this one as much but it was fun to read it again this one you know when you reach me was very very much a book that i felt worked just as well for an adult reader as a kid reader this one's really a kid's book even though i enjoyed it a lot as well um just the the themes in here so we, okay, let me just back up for a second. So we have this kid named George, but it's spelled with an S on the end because he's named for George Surratt. And that, and right there, that gives him problems at school. He's, he's, you know, he's kind of being picked on. There's a couple of kind of basic classic 
uh, central casting classroom bullies in the story. And a big part of the story is him trying to avoid those guys and then eventually dealing with them at school. And then he meets some people in his new apartment building. He meets a new friend named Safer and his eccentric family, the kids who all kind of choose their own names and decide whether or not they want to go to school or be homeschooled. And he and Safer has this whole plot where he wants to spy on a suspicious neighbor. And Rebecca Stead just does a really excellent job of dealing with this age group of of 11, 12 year olds and the shifting social scenes and the the cliques and the friendship fallouts and the, you know, George is, uh, another thing he's suffering from is that his longtime best friend went to summer camp and came back uh, gravitating to the popular kids and their friendship has kind of fallen by the wayside and he's floundering at school to find somebody new to, and he's kind of the person, a couple of friends that are just hiding in plain sight that we as readers were like, that would be the perfect friend for you. And it takes him a while to wake up and see it. I enjoyed it a lot. I was happy to read it again. All right, so then we get into some books. There's two books that I actually read start to finish since last we spoke. And one of them is a collection of short stories, Roman Stories by Jhumpa Lahiri. This is one of the books that I got in my big Christmas haul, and I finally had time to read it. And I, I really enjoyed these stories. This was a collection that held together nicely. Jupa Lahiri has written short stories and novels. The ones that I have read are The Interpreter of Maladies, Unaccustomed Earth, and The Namesake. Those were all written in English and had to do with the experiences of either immigrants from India who come to America or Indian American people born here, maybe would have immigrant parents. And they're really kind of beloved books, especially Interpreter of Maladies, which I do agree is her best book. That's if I if I had to only keep one of her books to reread, that would be the one I would grab. But in recent years, she's moved to Italy, become fluent in Italian, or I don't know, maybe she always was, I don't really know, but she started writing in Italian, and she lives in Rome, she writes, and I think, well, I think she lives here part-time because she's a professor somewhere, but she writes in Italian, and then she translates. She translated most of these stories, and then another translator translated a couple of the stories, Todd Portnowitz. So it's kind of a collaboration. I think that's an interesting shift. And um, reading reviews of this book, if you if you just read editorial reviews from publications like the New York Times or Kirkus Review, very solid reviews. If you go into something like Goodreads and you read uh, a lot of personal reviews, a lot of people, they either, they didn't dislike it, but they kind of lament that she's not writing the type of stories she used to write. And I didn't really share that opinion. I think that's kind of like when you expect a band to only play those hit songs from 30 years ago at the concert. You don't want to hear any of their new stuff. Uh, I don't. I just don't think it's really fair. I think it's fine to evolve and grow and explore different avenues of your your writing basket or whatever it is. So I actually I really loved the setting, the Rome, the fact that all the stories were in Rome and were from different points of view, from different kinds of people. Um, what I did not love was the uh, choice that she made, which felt a little bit like an affectation to me, of nobody having names. Occasionally, someone has an initial, but no one actually has a name in any of these stories, and that made me feel a little distant, especially because I didn't. If I read one of them, like. If one of them was in um, a magazine or something and that was the only story I read or in an anthology, but when when it's story after story and they all do that, it started to get a little old. So that was the one thing that I really didn't like, but her descriptions are beautiful. Okay, so you won't see that I just edited a chunk out because I immediately launched into a complete spoiler explanation of an entire story. So. That has now been excised. My favorite stories from the collection are Peace Parties, 
about a man uh, who goes to parties annually, uh, a friend of his wife that throws these wonderful parties until he kind of screws it up. And then we have uh, The Steps, which was a series of vignettes of different people who travel up and down these long steps every day. And there's different uh, people from different, different ages, different social classes, different ethnicities, and their experiences in the city. And then my other favorite story was Dante, oh gosh, how do you say, Dante Alighieri? Am I saying that right? Um, I know that it refers to the writer Dante, but it's a story about a woman who's, she's, she's at her mother-in-law's funeral and she's reflecting back over her life and her whole history of romances and love and uh, her experiences in Rome. And um, I just want to share this one paragraph that gives you a sense of Lahiri's writing in this book and why I enjoyed it. And she's remembering, she, she's had this, uh, she's told this story about this turbulent early romance and this kind of love triangle with her friend and this boy who writes a note and calls himself Dante. My parents were totally oblivious to my first romantic crisis. They tended to be unaware of my thoughts, problems, and worries. They didn't ask many questions, as if their curiosity once activated, would reveal too much about the creature they'd made together. They accepted that we had different tastes. At the supermarket, there were items in the cart designated for me alone, for the sandwiches I took to school, and for my snacks. They preferred to keep an eye on me from a distance, always cautiously, which made me feel like a dark, armored organism in their eyes. At dinner, conversation was scant. At home, we played host to silence as if it were a relative who lived discreetly among us, who came out of his room for meals, who joined us only when we were together and toward whom we had to behave with attention and respect. So I really did enjoy Roman stories by Jupa Lahiri. It makes me want to go to Italy. Then the next one, this is my favorite book of the week that I actually finished. Though the one that I'm reading now if I actually did finish it, it might have upended it. But the one that I finished that I loved was my reread of O. William by Elizabeth Strout. First of all, I have to uh, provide a correction to an earlier remark I made in a different video. I was talking about continuity in book covers, and but in the process of it, I, I said that this book cover was bland and boring and what the heck did it mean? It's like, why did they just throw a bunch of nice flowers? Okay, the tulips are very significant. And the fact that the tulips are snapped off, it's very significant. And I completely missed it. And this is the beauty of rereading, is you see things that you missed the first time. And back when I made that remark, Michael Clark pointed out, no, the tulips, the tulips are actually very that they have an emotional impact and and they do. I got to the, the, the two and tulips are mentioned more than once in the story, but there's a certain passage about the broken tulips. That's just really, really oh, one of those moments. So I take it back about the cover of the book. Love this book. Um, again, you, you really, this is not going to resonate properly unless you read the whole sequence. Uh, my name is Lucy Barton, Anything is Possible, and then this is book three. And it focuses on the relationship the relationship between Lucy Barton and her ex-husband, William. And Lucy and William were married for about 20 years, had two daughters, and then they've been apart for about 20 years at the time of this story. The daughters are grown, the daughters are married, and they they all live in New York City. William has been subsequently married two other times. Lucy has been subsequently married and her husband has recently passed away. So at the time of this story, William is, he actually has a birthday. He turns 71 and Lucy, I think she is early or mid 60s. She's younger than William. And in this story, William finds out two things that I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll only, I'm not exactly going to tell you because it kind of ruins, you know, it's a spoiler, but he finds two things happen. 
and he asked Lucy to accompany him on a road trip to Maine to look into a family mystery that he found out um, a piece of information about his deceased mother that he never knew that was kind of shocking to him and he wants to investigate it a little further and he asked Lucy as uh, the person who knows him best and the person who's known him the closest and the longest if she will go along kind of as moral support on this trip and she does so plot wise that's what it's about but what it's really about is so many things and I I took the most of the notes out because there was I swear there was 20 notes stuck in here and this is a second time reading well I had this post-it note where I had like 12 things that this book's really about and of course I've lost the post-it note so what is this book actually about it's about Lucy and William trying to understand themselves and each other and the fact that we are never going to completely understand ourselves or each other and we can strive we can try we can uncover you know new layers of the onion but we're never going to get down to the bottom of everything we're never really going to know another person and lucy says this in the book and it also applies to her mother-in-law katherine cole and this is one of the ways in which strout is a master at writing character because Catherine Cole, William's mother, is such a vivid and memorable character, but she's not even alive in any of these books. Maybe the first one, she's still alive, but she, she's a dead person, but her presence is so important. And it, it also, Lucy describing Catherine says so much about Lucy because Lucy will say, okay, here, let me tell you about my mother-in-law. She was so kind and likable and generous and then she tells these stories and i'm thinking whoa this woman is a piece of work she's passive aggressive she's she's really an odd one and then i think does lucy not see that does she see it but she doesn't feel like she should say it does she, or she doesn't really get it and and then i think well and none of these people are actually real i'm sitting here puzzling over all of this and these are all just invented people that Elizabeth Strout made up. And I'm also fascinated by the fact that Lucy is a novelist. The character Lucy Barton is a novelist, but these books are not her novels. These books are like asides from Lucy's life, but we hear mentions of novels and a memoir that she encounters other people who have read them and they have a reaction. So that's another layer, but they're all fabricated they, and they're not real. And I've spent a whole bunch of time thinking about them and about Lucy and her therapist and how she has post-traumatic stress and so did her father and her issues with her mother and her father and William's issues with his mother and oh it's all there's so much depth of character in these books if you need a fast-paced plot with lots of stuff happening this ain't it but if you like complicated multiple layered people and and you like writing where it the style is simple and you cannot for the life of you figure out how the author got her emotional hooks into you so deeply then you should read Elizabeth Strout who I maintain is underrated even though she gets a lot of coverage I still don't think that just the the sheer talent is is being fully acknowledged. Oh, William. It was really good. All right. So that leads us to the, what I'm reading now. And my poor little brain is just exploding and melting with the goodness of the reading this week, because now I've started reading James by Percival Everett. And oh my goodness, I am trying to read slowly. I am a kind of a fast reader. I kind of gulp and gobble but I am trying to slow it down and savor it and I don't want it to go by too fast and yes it is it is living up to my expectations I'm on page 92 I don't know it's not that long of a book I think there's 300 and something pages and I think I'm just gonna save this video has been long so I think I'm gonna save all of my remarks about James for next week because I probably will have finished it by then but it is Percival Everett's new book, a retelling of Huckleberry Finn from the perspective of Jim, 
the runaway slave from that novel. And I will talk about it next week. Okay, what are you reading? I know some of you are reading James. Tell me if you feel like I do that it's just, uh, I just, I just want to kind of stay in, in Everett's world there for as long as I can and just really to kind of take it all in. I think things are getting ready to take a dark turn, kind of like they do in Huckleberry Finn, only they're probably going to be, the turn's probably going to be darker in this book since it's from an adult's perspective and not a kid's. So we, you know, we've kind of, we've been going down the river and now I think some stuff's about to happen. So we'll see. I'll talk about it next week. Tell me what you've been reading. Any questions you want to put down there or on the other video, I'll be collecting them up. I'm also super behind in tags, but I, but I have to do my um, booktube prize video as well. So I'll get to all of it eventually in the next few weeks. But for now, I'm going to go have a great weekend and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.